Welcome to Here at Haas, a student-run podcast of the Berkeley Haas community. We're here to share the amazing stories of the students and faculty that surround us and change our lives. Today, we're joined by Trevor Ryan, an evening weekend student who is also a pro and international scout for the Oakland Days. Welcome to the podcast, Trevor. Thanks for having me, Ray. Happy to be here. You have such a fascinating background. It's a little untraditional, not only for Haas, but also for the NBA. And we'll get to that. But first, tell us about growing up, how you got into baseball, and eventually scouting. Sure. Well, I grew up in Chico, up in uh, North Valley, California. For people that don't know it, it's about 100,000 people, college town. My parents uh, had nothing to do with sports. They're both accountants. They run their own financial Mm -hmm. services firm. But uh, I was a big sports fan growing up. My dad liked sports. We're about three hours drive from the Bay Area. So we'd normally go to one A's and one Giants game every summer. Okay. I always got the pick. I always, the first day the schedule came out, I always said, all right, they're playing the Yankees on April 24th. That's the day. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So yeah, so I was just, I was a big fan growing up. Did you go to any of the interleague games between the A's and the Giants? Uh, I think, yeah, maybe once or twice growing up. So was baseball your favorite sport growing up? I was really uh, into all of the big three sports. I was a big football, basketball, and baseball guy, uh, depending on the season. I really just uh, got drawn to working in baseball at a really young age after I read the Moneyball book. Um, nice. It was just, it was kind of that like aha moment where I read the book, I looked at the characters and, and their background and, and what the A's were doing. Mm-hmm. And I said, hey, I think I could do that. And, you know, I was probably in like eighth grade or so at the time. Mm-hmm. From then on, I really just chartered my path and started making every move about, you know, finding a job in professional baseball. Yeah, that's crazy. You knew what you wanted to be in eighth grade. That's amazing. (laughs) Yeah, I was a super driven, high achiever, super type A kid. So yeah, I did. I decided that's what I wanted to do. I had super supportive parents. And so they just told me if, that's what you want to do, figure out, you know, how you're going to get there. So what I did was I started going online and looking at profiles of GMs and anyone else that I could find right? and just researching their background. And for anyone that didn't play professionally, because that's obviously a pretty common background, but for anyone that didn't play, Mm -hmm. I just started working backwards and, and figuring out what their paths were and seeing if I could emulate it. So yeah, I think you mentioned Moneyball. Were you surprised slash impressed by the background of Billy Bean? Yeah, obviously Billy's a Billy's a brilliant guy. I mean, he's a true innovator in the sport. So he, I mean, honestly, he he was kind of a hero of mine growing up. Uh, just mm-hmm. off that book, I always admired the A's approach to putting together a roster and really how they were able to be so competitive with such a small payroll. Yeah. And you, and then you see a lot of teams later emulating that model and not all of them were as successful uh, as the A's because really you look at the A's and you see they've consistently made the playoffs. I mean, I know they had some rebuilding years here and there, but really the last 20 years they've operated in the same small market and have made the playoffs more often than not, which is very incredible. Yeah, for sure. Billy and David Force and Dan Feinstein, who's the assistant GM, my boss, have all done really just an, an outstanding job fielding a competitive team on that shoestring budget. The A's don't have big time resources, and it's certainly a disadvantage, but there's also mm-hmm. advantages to being in our position as a smaller market team. Mm-hmm. We really, you know, can make daring, bold decisions. We can rebuild teams on the fly because there's not 
you know, there's not really that fear uh, of fan backlash of, of trading right. a star player uh, right, right when he's at the tip of his prime because our attendance isn't great anyways. And, you know, that's <laughs> just, and people expect us to do that. People, people understand the reality. So that, that gives, right. you know, that gives our front office a lot of latitude to do some daring things as well. Right. Okay. So let's talk about your job and working as a baseball scout. Can you tell us what you do on a regular, like day to day basis? Sure. I generally start the year in spring training because I don't mm-hmm. have really any office responsibilities. So in the off season, I'm home, but when the year starts, I'm going to Arizona. So I travel down there. I'm assigned three or four teams to cover throughout spring training. Right. And my job really is just to be the Oakland A's expert on those teams. So you're talking about opposing teams. Correct. Yeah. So I would have, so this year before we got sent home with the shutdown, I had the, the Giants, the Rockies and the Diamondbacks. Mm-hmm. So a typical day, I will just in spring training, I'll see which of those teams has the most, you know, appealing game for me that day. I will go to, you know, I'll go to the Giants game nice and early, watch batting practice, watch them do drills uh, and all that stuff, and then watch the game. When I get back to my hotel at night, I'll type up, you know, my notes, put stuff into our scouting system and send my observations and, and updates to the front office to, to help them in their decision making. So for our listeners who aren't familiar with baseball, spring training happens before the season. So it's in February and March. So that's what you do, I guess, scouting them in spring training. What about after when the regular season begins? Yeah, when the regular season begins, my job gets crazy. So most scouts are you know, in one defined area. So most scouts will either be a pro scout which means you watch other teams, minor league and major league players just in the U S or an amateur scout, which means you're watching junior college, college and high school players to prepare for the draft or just an international scout, which means you're traveling internationally preparing for, for those signings. But I do a hybrid role for the A's. So typically I'll be assigned different minor league teams around the U S so, you know, I'll travel, I'll hop on a plane and go to Montgomery, Alabama for five days uh, and then go to Charleston, South Carolina for another few days, Mm. you know, and then I mix in the international duties as well during the season. So I might stay in the U S for a couple of weeks, then go to the Dominican for a week or Mm. Colombia or you know, Mexico or, or somewhere like that. So it really, it really gets pretty hectic once the season gets going. Yeah. So there's lots of travel involved. What are your most favorite parts of the job? I think my favorite part of the job has got to be just seeing the world with someone else paying for it. (laughs) (laughs) That's nice. I mean, yeah, it it is really cool because, you know, you get to go on vacation you know, you might travel, you might go to Europe, go to New York or, or Chicago and see some locations. I mm-hmm. am really thankful. I've been all over the country and to multiple places internationally that I never would have gone right. on my own. It's really awesome to be able to see the world that way. And then also the access is pretty fun. Just as a fan of Major League Baseball growing up and now to be able to you know, go to games at the Coliseum and, you know, walk in the clubhouse and go on the field for BP and Mm -hmm. all that stuff is pretty outstanding. So how did you, I guess, get to this point in your career and how do you advance in your career? So like as a scout, do they have KPIs, uh, key performance indicators or metrics that you're judged upon? How much of your career depends on your success versus the team success. I'm just curious on the career 
growth as a scout and how you move onwards and upwards? So getting a job in, in Major League Baseball is really hard. It's, it's really competitive. Like I said, I, I knew early that I wanted to do it. So I went to college at, at UCLA, was not good enough to play there, but I figured the next best thing, you know, to be able to be involved with the team was, was to get a job with the, the baseball team at UCLA. So one thing led to another. I, I went from doing the laundry and clubhouse duties when I first, when I was a freshman to being their office guy, uh, the director of baseball operations by my senior year. So I'd run team travel and recruiting. And, and while I was there, we had a lot of players that ended up being high MLB draft picks. We had, you know, Brandon Crawford, Garrett Cole, Trevor Bauer. So through that, you know, I was really able to work that network with scouts and GMs and people that were coming in to see these guys Mm -hmm. and really just kind of build those relationships. Eventually the A's hired me. So I started with them uh, in 2011. I was an area scout. I was in charge of the southwestern part of the U.S. for the draft. I would go watch college, high school, junior college players to prepare for the draft as as one of many scouts across the United States. Mm -hmm. I did that for four years. And then they asked if I wanted to do my current job, which gives me a little bit more influence and lets me do a little bit more interesting stuff. So I've been doing that for the last four years. Mm -hmm. And then as far as career progression goes, it really, it really depends for a guy like me. The next thing would either be moving up in the scouting world, Mm -hmm. you know, becoming, you know, either a special assistant, which is kind of like, it's kind of just a way to recognize evaluators on your staff that are really important to your operations and to compensate them better also without making them a director of a department, which would be another potential next step because there's only, there's only so many departments that people can oversee. So Trevor, you mentioned a few potential roles that you would be, could be pursuing in the future. Why an MBA? Um, Why Haas? Just tell us about why you decided to pursue an MBA. Well, like we discussed earlier, I'm a pretty driven, ambitious guy. And I, I get very restless in any particular role for more than a couple of years or so. I'd gotten to the point where I didn't know a hundred percent what the next steps were going to be, but I knew that I needed a change Mm -hmm. and I looked at the MBA. I looked at friends that I had in the business world that had had come out of business school. And I was just really impressed with how my friends had changed. I noticed how polished they'd become. They all raved about this incredible network they have built, the great professors that they had. So I started researching it and what I really wanted to work on was a developing more managerial um, and leadership type skills, because right, right now I don't manage people. Mm -hmm. So I don't really have a lot of real life experience doing that. So I thought that would be something to add to my, make me more well-rounded. Right. Uh, And then also add some real hard skills, some technical skills. You know, it's not just baseball. Uh, Every other industry in our economy really is going more Mm -hmm. data-driven, more analytical. And while I I come from a econ undergrad background, I didn't feel like I had really strong training in -hmm. in a lot of those, those analytical disciplines. So I just felt like coming to Haas would be a good opportunity to round myself out from a professional level, mm-hmm. moving forward in baseball, and also give me options if you know baseball wasn't in the cards moving forward. It would give me 
uh, a good launching pad for something else if that ended up being the path. Right. And I think, as we discussed earlier, the Oakland A's, uh, a very progressive organization, they're probably at the forefront of utilizing new methods to whether it's to evaluate players or just develop certain processes. I think Paul D. Podesta was one of the A's originals on Moneyball. And right now, I think he's with the Cleveland Browns and he's the chief strategy officer. So uh, on that note, can you compare maybe some of the skills required to be a good baseball scout and how that can translate to other industries? Yeah. Well, when you're looking at running a baseball team and evaluating players, Mm -hmm. it's really similar to to any strategy role in a big company where you're evaluating, you know, your different options that are in front of you. Um, You're gathering data, you're using that data and also, you might analyze from a qualitative standpoint to go into that decision. And I always compare it to, you know, to running a hedge fund, to picking stocks really, because, you know, the stock market now, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, quants out there. Mm -hmm. Everyone has the same information, just like baseball. Mm -hmm. Every team has some deep analytical processes that they go through right and really the key you know just like not everybody can outperform the stock market not everybody can win in pro sports without learning how to use that data right and creating good qualitative analytical frameworks on top of that to move forward yeah and you talk about contracts right you see tons of not just baseball teams but sports teams dole out way too much for a player or on the flip side they get that player at a bargain basement deal and so these are all i guess decisions that are made just as an organization right for most successful organizations they mostly hit on their free agent signings um, or draft picks and the ones that are maybe not so successful are the ones that are failing on those. Yeah. And I I think the most successful teams, just like any business are the teams that have a process, right. That have like an identity with the A's. Our process is that we're going to stick to our numbers, to what our evaluation says and go with that decision. Mm -hmm. You know, even if, even if we look silly, it really allows us to, to stick to our process and make the best decisions we have, make bold decisions, knowing that they're not all going to work out. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have some closing questions for you. You know, surprise, surprise. They are sports slash baseball related. So (laughs) this is just kind of like our lightning round. You can consider this extra innings. First, who is your favorite baseball player growing up? So I, I was a big A's guy. So I love yeah. the Mark Mulder, Barry Zito, Tim Hudson, oh, that kind yeah. of trio of pitchers. Right. Like those, that was my, those were my guys. Yeah. And they weren't featured in Moneyball. That was one thing that most people who don't follow baseball or sports know is that those three pitchers carried the load for the A's, but I think they just wanted totally. to focus on the analytics side. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Right. They, uh, Declined to mention those guys and Miguel Tejada and Mm -hmm. Eric Chavez and some other other pretty good players. Yeah, for sure. Who is your favorite player that you scouted? Well, the the best player that I scouted that Mm -hmm. I am still mad to this day that we didn't get him was Cody Bellinger uh, Mm -hmm. of the Dodgers. Yeah. He was a high school kid in Arizona Uh when I uh, was covering that area. Yeah. And we really liked him. He was a great kid. His dad yeah. played in the big leagues. Yeah. Um, he was super, super athletic. He, you know, he was a, you know, he's a pretty good hitter, but right. he was just so skinny and weak. <laughs> he, he was like a hundred, he was probably like six to mm-hmm. like 160 pounds. He, he hit one home run his senior year of high school <laughs> in Arizona. Wow. Everything added up, but he was, he was playing first base at the time. 
Mm. And he wanted a lot of money to sign. And we just, we just kind of chickened out at the end, unfortunately. Didn't get him. And now he's oh, MVP man. of the league. Right, so, yeah. Perennial a all-star. One. What was your favorite sports movie growing up? I really like the original Major League. I mean, mm. that's... That's not really a kids nice. movie, so I wouldn't. That wouldn't be us. Uh, so <laughs> it's <laughs> that okay. wasn't my favorite movie growing up. But uh, if you want to, it's a little bit over the top. But if you want, yeah. uh, a relatively accurate look at some of the uh, more ex- extreme guys in the league, you know, major leagues. <laughs> That's like that. a accurate look at the clubhouse culture. And you know, it's all caricatures, but you know, you you got all all types in clubhouses, you know, so. Yeah. Well, I like that movie because my favorite MLB team is the Indians. I actually lived in Cleveland in 95 when they went to the World Series. So that's a that's a perfect movie for me. That was an exciting time to be an Indians fan back then. What has been your favorite activity while sheltering in place? I think my favorite thing that I do, Mm -hmm. honestly, is just going for long runs outside. It's like that one moment where you just feel normal (laughs) Mm. you kind of forget that we're all in you know this tough situation right and we're all stuck inside so i'm i'm a big runner i love getting out in the mornings throwing in a podcast and you know getting a few miles in yeah what's your favorite podcast or a couple that you listen to i really love bill simmons podcast Mm, he's been doing it a long time and he always has great uh guests from both sports and uh entertainment Right. Big Boston guy. Oh yeah. Big time. Yeah. He's a huge, he's a huge Homer, but he's fun to listen to anyways. Okay. So last question I have, if you had a piece of advice for prospective students who are seeking an MBA, especially those from a non-traditional field, what would it be? Definitely do it. I mean, we have a lot of people from non-traditional fields. Obviously you have to look at your own situation and you know it's it's expensive it's a lot lot of money you got to determine if that investment is going to be worth it for your career progression right i honestly think you know an mba is like the big boy version of a liberal arts education anybody can get a lot out of it it's a Mm. it's a tremendous tremendous curriculum it teaches you how to think and then you can you know you can specialize in and really make it whatever you want once you get into those electives too. So I have nothing but encouragement for anyone out there seeking an MBA. Well, thank you, Trevor, so much for coming on the podcast today. Thanks for having me, Ray. It was fun. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Here at Haas. If you enjoyed our show, please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast player and give us a rating and review. If you want to hear more about alumni perspectives, check out our sister podcast, One Haas, or you can subscribe to our monthly newsletter at onehaas.org. That's spelled O-N-E-H-A-A-S dot O-R-G. I'm Ray Guan, and we'll see you next time here at Haas.